operated electrical device that's designed to protect the circuit, the primary circuit, from damage caused by overloads or shorts to that circuit. You know, its basic function is to interrupt that high momentary current flow. Um, so unlike fuses, which, you know, will burn out uh, operated once, um, the medium voltage circuit breaker can be reset and resume normal operations uh, for the circuit. Control and detection for medium voltage circuit breakers in today market are usually provided by an external relay device, uh, which is wired into the switch here. Um, there are some breakers on the market in low voltage and even medium voltage that have the relays integrated into them for control purposes. Uh, so some do and some don't. All right. Basic ratings of your medium voltage anti circuit breakers. Uh, the, the levels of voltage that you see are usually 5, 8, 15, 27, and 38 kV voltage. Uh, primary current currents uh, range from 1200 to 2000, 3000, and 4000. And in some cases, you may even see 5000 amps uh, with some forced air cooling or 4000 amps with forced air cooling. Um, and this is done, of course, by fans. Uh, directly blowing the air through or around the circuit breakers themselves. Um, fault breaking currents, and the, this is the primary, you know, ratings of the, the breaker and its abilities to break the faults of the primary circuits uh, can range from 16 all the way up to 75,000 amps. Um, and you'll see uh, sometimes on these ratings, it'll refer to either three second or a two second withstand rating. Um, in, in some instances, you'll see that the, the actual ANSI switch gear is rated for two seconds, um, and that's according to the standard. Uh, in, in the past, you used to see that uh, breakers would be rated to three seconds, and, and this three-second rating of the past was really just to allow for older electromechanical relays in, in the past that if you had a long string of relays, uh, it would take a long period of time for the relays to catch up and tri trip the breaker. Um, with today's new electronic relays, uh, this three second rating is no longer required and the ANSI standard has uh, gone to a two second rating on the medium voltage circuit breaker. Um, but this, as that said, the uh, switch gear has always had a two second rating. So really the three second rating on the breaker was uh, nothing that, uh, was required in a sense because uh, the system as a whole could only handle two seconds. Uh, the ANSI standards, as I was referring to, the IEEE standards, uh, you'll sometimes hear it referred to, you know, C37.04 or C37.06 or C30 or 09 or 013. Um, and each of these standards is defines the structure of the breaker, how it's rated, how it's tested. Uh, both testing um, your type testing, which is done in the laboratory, such as Kima, and then also your production tests, which are done you know, uh, once final production is released to the market. Um, depending on how you're applying your breaker, you could be using you know, additional standards, such as a C37013, which is directly uh, suited for the generator application market. but uh, that doesn't mean that a breaker that doesn't have that rating can't be applied to a generator breaker. It just means it hasn't been tested according to that standard. Um, additionally, at the bottom, you will see we now have this IEEE standard listed. Uh, this just came out last fall. This is a new dual standard, um, and this is with the harmonization of both IAC and ANSI. Um, so it's, it's now a new global standard. And this first global standard that has come out is particularly uh, focused at uh, generator breaking um, in the medium voltage market using circuit breakers. So how does a medium voltage circuit breaker work? Well, it, a circuit breaker is mechanical means that separates two contacts. And those two contacts are in an arc belching medium. And, they, and that interrupts the flow of the electricity. Now, there are several different types of arc quelching technologies uh, that have been in the market you know, in the years and presently. Um, right now, the number one technology is the vacuum interrupter, which we'll touch base on here uh, a little more in depth. 
um, FS6 interrupters, which isn't too dissimilar from vacuum interrupters. It's just using the uh, hexafluoride gas uh, in, in its enclosure rather than a complete vacuum. And then oil and air magnetic. Uh, both of these are older technologies which have been mostly phased out of the market. Um, and then there's the two types of mechanisms in the market. And you, you know, primarily spring has always been uh, the number one type of mechanism in the market. And then you now see uh, medium voltage breakers with a magnetic type actuator. And from ABB, we offer the ADVAC and the AMVAC in the ANSI market, but additionally, we do have IEC products uh, where the ADVAX uh, sister product would be the DD4 uh, spring charge breaker, and the AMVAX sister product would be the VM1 magnetic actuator breaker. So the basic overview of a medium voltage circuit breaker and what it consists here is there's a side away uh, cutout and what you see is on the top, you have the upper contact terminal for the primary current flowing path. Um, this then goes down and leads into item two, the vacuum interrupter, uh, where you have the two contacts, and I'll get into this construction in just a little bit. Um, and then three, the, the epoxy resin enclosure. So this epoxy is an injected material into a mold that's injected around the vacuum interrupter to encase it and its associated parts for protection. Um, then down below the uh, vacuum interrupter, you have the lower contact terminal. Um, the lower contact terminal is, is normally at the area where you have the movable contact of the vacuum interrupter, and we'll, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, then to, to provide that movement to the movable contact, you have these contact force springs uh, below it in, in a push rod and these springs are there to provide the correct amount of pressure um, on the contacts when the circuit breaker is closed so because the current flow and voltage will, will have a tendency to want to try to push those apart um, and so we have to keep a certain amount of pressure there you know uh, during the full fault of the that the circuit breaker is rated to handle um, and for those uh, contacts for springs we have a little push rod which then translates to the transmission per se of the uh, breaker itself um, looks like i had a little error here <laughs> uh, number nine so within the 10 number 10 we have the transmission rod uh, which is connected to your main operating mechanism through your uh, main shaft and your main shaft can sometimes be a part of your mechanism or it could be you know, slightly independent of your mechanism. Um, in this cutaway view, it's actually part of the main mechanism itself. Um, and then your, your main shaft would then be operated by some kind of a operation assembly, uh, which would have your coils, your link switches, everything that would uh, do the kinematics of the open and close operations of the breaker. And then all of this is enclosed into a mechanism frame. Over the years, um, as I discussed, the, the technologies of our Carlton mediums, and we're going to show here you can see that uh, both oil and air magnetic breakers are no longer produced in, into the market. Uh, there are still some uh, existing in installation, but uh, they're slowly being replaced by FS6 and vacuum. And vacuum is now the preferred medium of our quelching technology. So to talk about the vacuum interrupter, the vacuum interrupters, of course, uh, started back in 1926. Some experimentation through the California Institute of Technology. Um, these early vacuum interrupters were actually glass enclosed. Uh, they had some sort of uh, pump device that had to keep the vacuum on there and the, the con one movable contact but uh, two stationary contacts and this was you know seemed to be uh, inadequate for medium voltage uh, applications until the development of the vacuum interrupter um, and with ABB you'll see we, we offer a wide range of vacuum interrupters uh, and they vary in size and of course the size does dictate uh, whether you know, the voltage, the carrying current, and the fault breaking current ability of that vacuum interrupter. 
And a lot of this has to do with not just the, the width of the contacts, the spacing of the contacts, uh, how far the, the stroke of the contacts internal to the vacuum interrupter. So uh, the vacuum interrupter design is, is pretty basic, but uh, it actually performs a very significant function of the main function of the circuit breaker. So here you see we have the main stem, um, and this is the stem that moves uh, to allow the contacts to open and close. And because of that movement, we don't want that stem to twist left or right. So then we have a device uh, which, which guides the stem back and forth, but keeps it from twisting, which is number two, the twist protection. And then uh, next to that is the bellows. Now the bellows is a like a flexible metal uh, ring that allows the vacuum to stay inside the interrupter and, and keep the uh, outside air pressure from getting in. Um, of course, being that the, the uh, ex arc extinguishing medium is the vacuum itself, um, this is this is very important uh, for the life of the interrupter. Uh, most vacuum interrupters have a projected life of 20 years, but uh, vacuum interrupters have been into the market for well over that, and we're now seeing that they're they're living well beyond the 20 year and 30 year mark um, that uh, mathematical calculations had dictated. Um, so then we get to the interrupter lid, which is really just uh, main assembly of the interrupter and the, the lid itself can sometimes be metal or it could be a ceramic. Um, and then internal, we have a shielding um, which protects uh, the bellows from any type of uh, vaporized metals that may occur to, to deposit, on, deposit onto the bellows. So when you, when you break the uh, primary circuit, you'll get an arc and we'll discuss the, this arcing in just a few moments. And this arcing will cause um, the metal to vaporize inside the vacuum and that, that vaporized metal can deposit in certain areas. Um, so you have these shieldings. And then you have the ceramic in insulators. The ceramic insulators, of course, uh, insulate from primary voltage trumping from one side to the other when the contacts are open, but also helps insulate uh, from the outside air getting into the vacuum chamber. Um, then additional shield around the contacts, which is there and helps collect uh, vaporized metals and keeps them from redepositing onto the primary contact. Um, and then you have, as you see number eight, the top contact is the movable contact, which goes up and down, uh, flexing the bellows above it. And then nine is a stationary contact, which is always fixed and held in place. And then additionally, you have another interrupter lid on the other end. So there are several different types of contact designs uh, in the vacuum interrupter uh, world. Um, two primary designs for short circuit currents above 10,000 amps is your transverse contact system, uh, which gives you a TMF, um, as we call it, uh, excuse me, arcing. Um, so this transrational motive force uh, that is caused when the two contacts come apart, the, you know, the voltage and current are going to want to continue to flow between those two contacts. And so what you get is this arcing. And through the design of the contacts, we can control this arc. Um, on to the left, where the, you have the TMF, and on the right, you have the AMF. Um, and you can see that how each design affects the, the type of arcs that are seen. Uh, primarily ABB vacuum interrupters, we use the, the spiral or the TMF contact design, uh, which uh, makes the arc kind of move at, across the contacts, um, kind of much like a, a bolt of lightning traveling across the land. And, and then until it gets to a point where it either can fall off the edge or the contact spacing is far enough that the uh, current will not continue to flow after you know, it's, it's hit a uh, current zero. Uh, the AF, AMF mode or diffuse arc, um, this contact system it, you know, gives a very wide arcing range and, and is subjected to uh, what we call deposition. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So what happens during the fault breaking or even standard load breaking uh, when 
when you separate your contacts, you have a current loop and do these magnetic forces uh, by the flow of the electricity. In the case of spiral contacts, the, the, this arcing will rotate around according to Lorenz's Lorentz force. Um, now at the point of arcing, you see that we have this vaporization and, and a creation of a cathode. And this causes, as I mentioned before, a vaporization of material into the vacuum interrupter. Um, this vaporized material does help continue to conduct electricity, and it doesn't extinguish until um, the, the voltage hit or current hits zero. Um, so switching in, in the medium voltage vacuum interrupter, uh, you see here we have a system voltage and enters and following it out of phase out of another phase is your short circuit current um, So then we have a contact separation during the short circuit current You can see that you have an arcing voltage up until the point of the short circuit current interruption now this arc voltage that is the, the uh, Voltage that we see in between the contacts that is traveling around at the point of time uh, vaporizing metal and and due to this you will see at the end of the final interruption uh, a TRV or trans, trans, transient recovery voltage. Now this transient recovery voltage we'll talk about a little more detail uh, um, but this can cause adverse effects onto your system uh, especially in terms of capacitor bank switching um, and into your, your harmonic systems uh, it, it degrades the overall life of your system and even your uh, contacts of your vacuum interrupter. So during the breaking, uh, not just the importance of the design of the contacts, uh, there's also the material of the contacts. So depending on your composition, you can reduce this, this ability of arcing. Um, so the less current that you get, the, the, the less damage that will Cause because to your, your contacts. Um, here below you can see uh, new condition contact and one after 30 uh, full short circuit operations. Um, this is primarily the AVB design that we utilize. And if you look right at the red arrow that's pointing at the, the uh, one with 30, uh, 30 operations, you can actually see a line looks like it's been scribed onto that contact surface, and that is a, an actual arc transverse line. And then to the right, you can see a contact, uh, the AMF type. And in this AMF type of design, uh, because of the diffuse arc uh, and the vaporized material, the material can redeposit onto that type of contact and cause little hills and valleys. And these hills and valleys can, can actually give you a false indication of contact where if you're using some sort of visual measurement of contact wear. Um, and I'll speak a little more about uh, contact wear in the vacuum interrupter in just a minute when we look at the design of the poles. So just to touch base on what we were talking about, about the uh, TRV voltage, um, and this has a lot to do with your capacitive switching. Now, a capacitive switching rating on a breaker uh, is, is like a secondary rating. Uh, a breaker is primarily designed to break a large fault, uh, but you know that's a very rare occurrence for the circuit breaker. A lot of times, the breaker will be switching a lot, and sometimes they're also used both to for fault breaking, but also for switching in and out capacitor banks. Um, so we developed a, a new kind of harmonized standard between the IEC and IEEE standards. Um, in the past, with IEEE, we had general purpose and definite purpose ratings of the uh, ability of passive switching. Um, now we've adopted uh, the C2, C1, and C0 uh, rating. Uh, and, and primarily the C2, C1, or C0 is, is what you look for in the rating itself. Uh, C2 being a very low probability of restrike, C1 being a low probability of restrike, and, and C0 being an un, you know, unspecified probability. Now, if a breaker was tested to the old standard of uh, definite purpose, uh, a definite purpose breaker could only be rated as a C1. Um, in order for it to be rated as a C2, that breaker would then have to be undergo additional testing 
uh, to the new standard to have a C2 rating. So what's in that rating? Um, for example, we have here a rating of uh, 1,030 amps at C2, 18 kA, 2.4 thousand hertz, or here's another rating next to it. So really the rating, the part of the rating you want to look for in a medium voltage circuit breaker is the C2, the C1, and the C0. Um, now the current is, is also important, but what you get is this is the current that would be seen from the capacitor during the switching. It does not mean it couldn't handle a higher current. It just means that if, you, if you're at that current or below, then you will experience the C2 performance. Uh, once you start to go above that current, then you, you kind of get into a C1 performance range, and, and then there could be a certain value where you get even higher, at which case you would be at a C0 range. Um, so the breaker can break the higher currents that, like, say, if, a, if it was a 1,200 amp breaker, it could break 1,200 amps of capacitor current to a point, uh, but you would see a restrike uh, between the contacts and hence a associated TRV into your system. So additionally, you see the, the KA inrush current, um, and this inrush current doesn't mean that the breaker can't have a higher inrush. It can have higher inrush uh, during the switching. Uh, it's just that this, this was what was seen and observed during the testing, and it's usually due to the setup at the lab. Um, and also that, same, that goes for the frequency that is seen. Uh, and these two items can change uh, depending upon you know, a circuit design. So most people try to design their, their circuits to protect from over voltage events um, by choosing the C2, but it still doesn't guarantee a restrike or pre-strike operation. Uh, over the life of the breaker, uh, during wear or you know, fault breaking, uh, depending upon what that breaker is subjected to during its lifetime, you're eventually going to or could have a restrike or a pre-strike event. So you must plan for that uh, in your control systems. So I'll touch base a little more on uh, capacitive switching in just a little bit. Uh, let's get back into uh, the basic design elements of the medium voltage circuit breaker. Um, so we have the embedded pole technology, um, and maybe it is had this embedded pole technology, I think, well over 20 years now almost. And uh, we have it both in the IEC, ANSI markets, uh, the indoor, outdoor markets. And, and the reason behind an embedded pole is it encapsulates the vacuum interrupter and it protects that vacuum interrupter from uh, not just damages, but contamination on the outside that could tr cause tracking or you know, voltage to, to go across uh, from one terminal to the other. Um, these poles also give it, you know, some rigid stability for keeping the interrupter in place during the fault breaking of, of uh, the breaker. Um, and it also keeps you from having to, to go in and, and clean off the primary circuits of the breaker. So in, in some exposed vacuum interrupter breakers, if you've got it in a contaminated area with, uh, say, a coal plant or whatever it may be, uh, you may have to go in routinely and clean off these vacuum interrupters to prevent uh, voltage from tracking or prevent any corona issues or BIL issues that uh, would occur from that. Um, so again, to the uh, internal components of the embedded pole, um, of course, on the top part, you have the upper contact terminal, which then is bolted to your vacuum interrupter. And your vacuum interrupter, then again, down to your movable contact. And remember, we, we talked about the internals of the vacuum interrupter. And then you can see that uh, there's that black twist protection right there above uh, number four, which shows the primary current path. And that current comes down from the vacuum interrupter uh, to six, which is a movable band. In, in some cases, it, this contact may be a, a type of ball bearing uh, contact at higher current ratings, um, depending upon you know, uh, the design of the vacuum interrupter, the heat dissipation required, et cetera. Um, and then this goes down to your lower uh, primary contact terminal. Um, then 
to the contact spring forces, which I had mentioned before. And, and this is the point I want to get to about contact, where here at number seven, where you have these contact springs that are providing that pressure to the contacts. Um, in this design, there's an extra you know, four millimeters of travel of spring. So uh, the, our contacts in our vacuum interrupters, their design, to only wear one millimeter within their entire lifetime. Well, in this contact spring cut, we, we put in an extra four millimeters of travel. So that still leaves another three millimeters uh, available should something occur, of course. But this is designed for the life of the breaker so that no adjustments or measurements are required of the vacuum interrupter uh, while in service. So this gets us into uh, spring actuation, and we're gonna get into two different types of mechanisms, as I had mentioned previously. The spring actuated uh, will be first, and, and we offer here at ADP a ADVAC ANSI breaker. Um, of course, we do have a whole range of IEC breakers that are offered into the global marketplaces, as well as the ANSI offering into global marketplaces. Um, so here, like Mary, we have the ADVAC, which is rated for 5, 8, 15 kV. Um, it is a spring charge type breaker. Um, we do go up to 63 kA. Uh, the breaker itself will be rated at 3,000 amp, but we do uh, operate to 4,000 amp, but the system has to have forced air cooling around the breaker. So what we do is we just take the 3,000 amp breaker and with the forced air cooling, we're able to get the 4,000 amp uh, rating in uh, most manufacturers accomplish the same thing in the same manner. Um, and, and so the current really, the current path can handle it is, is the heat dissipation to meet the standard requirements. Um, additionally, we do offer some narrow design platform breakers, uh, such as the Relia Gear. And this is the VMAX A Relia Gear, which is one of our newest offerings into the market. Uh, this breaker can go up to 31.5 kA and 2,000 amps and 15 kV. And then it has a, a kind of sister product, which is has both a ANSI and IAC rating. Um, the, the ANSI rating breakers uh, meet certain interlock requirements through mechanical means. Um, I, some IAC breakers that we offer, we do offer also with an ANSI rating. Um, but those breakers, such as this one, the VMAX W, we do that using um, electromechanical re relay uh, means or extra relay coils inside the breaker uh, to meet that. So there's two different ways that you can meet a certain parts of the ANSI standards. So both or all three of these breakers do utilize the EL mechanism breaker, uh, no, excuse me, the EL mechanism. And the EL mechanism has certain components that, fetch, that go from the mechanism itself to the uh, primary conductive path. So as you can see, there's a minimal amount of uh, connecting rods here. We have the mechanism, which is very easily removable. Uh, it, it then has just a transmission shaft off of the main shaft. And, and this mechanism isn't integrated into the main shaft. So it makes it very easy uh, for maintenance and to remove the mechanism that contains the main closing spring, which has all the energy that needs to be translated into the closing operation of the brakes to put the contact force required in the vacuum interrupter. Uh, the spring charged uh, EL mechanism is, is our standard market, market offering in the sense that uh, most people in the medium voltage market are looking for spring charge. Uh, they look for you know the, the most cheapest, most reliable um, type of offering that you can uh, to the market. And, and this device provides us with that uh, reduced cost because this mechanism is also utilized, and I'll get into just a second, a lot of our other breaker product offerings. Um, as I was talking about, it has a main disadvantage because of its modularity. Um, and we'll talk about how the coils and charge motor are, are very easily replaced. Uh, the breakers uh, do carry a C2 capacitive switch rating. And we do have reduced power consumption with this type of mechanism as opposed to the rest of the industry in terms of the charging coil or charging motor and the coils that we utilize. And I'll talk about those in just a minute.
So this EL mechanism uh, is, even though it's new into the ANSI market within the last few years, uh, it has really been in the global marketplace for well over 10 years. Um, and it is, uh, was first implemented in our low voltage de design breakers, the Emacs type design breakers and then integrated into our IEC medium voltage breakers, such as the BD4 and the VMAX. And now we have recently released it into the ADVAC product line and then the VMAX A product line. Um, so there, the, these uh, mechanisms are supported globally. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of them into the marketplace and it's a tried and true design. So just to go over the basics of one of these medium voltage circuit breakers that utilize the EL mechanism. You'll see we have uh, auxiliary contacts which provide signaling for opening and closing. These are direct, directly driven from the main shaft of the breaker. Um, and then here's your locations of your basic uh, operating controls, your manual open and close push button, and your indicators for breaker charge, discharge, breaker open, uh, breaker closed. Uh, additionally, you can see right here as you're looking at the motor, there's a, one screw right there. Uh, that single screw is what actually holds the motor onto the main frame. If, if that screw is taken out, you pull the motor off to the side, you unplug it, and you have the, the charging motor out just as fast as I'm saying it. So it's, it's very simple maintenance uh, to change, say, a charging motor or even your coil pack, which is to the right here, there's a screw. You take out this single screw. There's a little removable handle you grab and you pull out the coil pack, which will have your open coil, your closed coil, and your undervolted coil. And this same design, as I mentioned, is in you know, multiple platforms of our breakers. So maintenance personnel uh, between low voltage and medium voltage uh, can take similar training in how to you know, maintain these type of breakers. And as I had mentioned about the uh, innovative concept, it's a very simple device which can be simply removed and replaced uh, from the main housing of the breaker after you've removed you know, your charging motor and your coil packs, which only take you a few minutes. You have additionally about another you know, 12 screws or bolts to take out and a couple of pins that snap right out to remove this device from the main shaft of the breaker and the main frame in which case it can then be replaced uh, within less than an hour for the maintenance of the entire mechanism. So the uh, EL mechanism, I'm gonna go over a slight overview of its operation. Um, so in the center of the mechanism, around number one, you have the main operating shaft. Now this is, this is different than the main shaft of the breaker itself, it's just the operating shaft of the mechanism. Um, that shaft is, is turned by either using the front charging handle of the breaker or uh, the charging motor itself. And this then charges the spring, which is down on the bottom of number three. So as it slowly ratches it up, it, the pressure compresses the bottom uh, spring. Once the closing spring is completely charged um, and the closing force works, there's a hook that will latch into place. Um, once, once that hook is relaxed into place, then the signaling device for the closing spring has, has uh, once the closing hook latches, the closing hook remains locked by the closing shaft, okay? And then the, there's an opening hook that reaches a position. And this opening hook has a cam toggle assembly, which then signals that the uh, closing spring has been charged once it goes into position. So when you push the closing button, the main closing shaft turns and releases this closing hook. And this closing hook then releases the main charge of the spring and then translates that force into the lever assembly in a counterclockwise motion. This causes the breaker to then to close. Once the breaker is closed, the levers receive, uh, excuse me, reach another settled position um, and you can see here just the slight little uh, actuating parts of the mechanism. And it, the, the brief overview is to, to help uh, people understand what's going on. But a lot of times maintenance personnel will look at this and use it to say, okay, 
if there's an error, what do I go check? What do I look for? Or even what are the points to grease? Because you can see the contact points of the parts of the mechanism. So once the breaker is closed and then you have the operating hook is in, in place, uh, the gear motor will then start to turn again. And, uh, this, is, this is done through the signaling of the main mechanism. The, the push button. Okay, once the breaker is closed, and then you push, the opening shaft turns and releases the opening hook. The opening hook releases the central hook and the cams toggle. And this releases the levers and provides the energy to allow the mechanism to then open. Uh, the main shaft will open on its own because it has pressure from those contact spring, springs in each of, underneath each of the vacuum interrupters, but also there is an opening spring that is connected to the main shaft of the breaker. So during the opening um, of the breaker, all the energy is translated back from the, the main housing itself back into this EL mechanism. Uh, and it's not provided by the EL mechanism during the opening operations. Uh, the EL mechanism also has anti-pump built into it mechanically. Uh, anti-pump devices used to be in the past, uh, electromechanical relays, uh, these type of devices had to have some sort of voltage in order to provide anti-pumping. So if you were to go up to an older breaker and, and try to you know, test the anti-pump manually, uh, a lot of time, it, uh, depending upon the design of the breaker, you would be able to pump the breaker. Um, and anti-pumping pre uh, prevents the breaker from being able to have subsequent open and closing in a rapid fashion, whether it be you know by the operator or by a controlling relay, um, and if if this was to occur on a medium voltage circuit breaker, it could cause uh, problems into your system, such as introducing TRBs, and also if you're controlling some kind of motor or running off a generator, um, it, it would cause even further damage to your network. This type of anti-pumping, as I was mentioning, on the EL or EL mechanism is mechanical, and it doesn't need the relay, as I was referring to just a moment ago. Um, so being that it's mechanical, uh, you cannot pump the breaker, even locally, if you were to go up to the breaker and operate the buttons manually. Um, so if you press and hold the open button, you'll see that there's this little piece, we call it a mechanical anti-pumping device, that actually falls down but below the closed push button. Um, and here on the right, you'll see that there is a side cutout view of the mechanism itself and that anti-pumping piece, which is operated by the opening shaft lever. Now, this shaft is operated both by the coil and by the main opening push button. So when the button or coil are activated, it pushes this piece down. And this piece is actually a, it's like a, a spacer trigger between the closing push button and the closing lever shaft. Um, the closing push button is directly actuated by the closing coil. So if you were to send a signal to the breaker to close on an EL mechanism breaker, you would literally see the closing push button move with the actuation of that coil. Um, and so that would help you give a visual indication uh, that your coil is working properly. Um, and if there's ever any kind of issue, uh, there are some other, other interlocks that do actuate this anti-pumping device. Um, so if one of those uh, mechanical interlocks is actuated, you would be able to see that closing push button move with the breaker not operate. And, and that gives you an indication that there, there is some mechanical means that is blocking the closing feature uh, at the point that that is occurring. And this is usually during uh, when a breaker is between an intermediate position between, because in an anti-breaker we have three positions in a cell. We have disconnect, test, and connected. And when you rack the breaker in, you're not allowed to be able to close the breaker in any intermediate position. So in the intermediate position, the interlocks of the breaker would actuate this anti-pumping mechanism and prevent mechanical or uh, local or even electrical closing of the breaker. Um, now to get into the smart coil technologies, which are uh, being applied to our EL mechanism breakers, both in the low voltage and medium voltage uh, breakers. 
as I had mentioned before, it's very simple to remove your coils by just removing a, a single screw and then pulling this whole pack out, which contains your closed coil, your open coil, your under voltage coil. Um, these new type of coils are such that they have a very low current draw. Um, and they use a small internal electronic board, which helps provide this. Uh, so this board will make the coil act like a standard uh, coil of the past, whereas if there was a problem with the coil, it would make the circuit open, uh, per se. But old coils of the past had the failure where if they shorted out, you didn't know the coil was bad. So uh, in the, in the uh, medium voltage market, we do what's called coil monitoring. And in past designs, uh, this was done by monitoring the current that was flowing through the open coil. And that could have been done via a relay, a light, or whatever the, the circuit means may have been. Um, but if that coil had shorted out, that light or that indication would still say that it was good. Well, smart coils uh, will actually go in and they test the impedance, uh, the, the board inside will test the impedance of the coil itself. And so if that impedance is outside of a specific range, it will open up the circuit and, and give the failure of, of the coil saying that something's wrong. Also, this, this circuit board provides overcurrent and short circuit protection uh, for the coil. Um, it does have a temperature protection feature, but that feature does not activate until you've well exceeded the internal acceptable temperature range of ANSI switchgear. So, um, now to go from the spring actuated type mechanism breakers, we're going to go into the magnetic actuator. Um, in AVB, we developed the magnetic actuator back in the 90s, and it originally was developed for an outdoor type application, just like an OVR type application. Um, and then we found it useful for indoor and other outdoor product lines. Um, so it's been instituted into our outdoor RMAG product, which is a, a big seller in the outdoor market. Um, and in our VM1, which is the IEC version of an AMVAC, and then the AMVAC, of course, which is our ANSI circuit breaker, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so the ANSI AMVAC circuit breaker that we offer here uh, in the US, it, it's the only medium voltage circuit breaker on the market to come out with a standard five-year warranty on the indoor. Um, and this is because of the low, no maintenance uh, that we promote about the breakers that we're able to provide this warranty standard with every breaker. Uh, when it comes to spring charge breakers, you would have to pay additional costs for this warranty. So this comes standard. And talking about, you know, why would you want, you know, a magnetic actuated versus a spring charge? Uh, well, any spring charge breaker, you're going to have to do maintenance. Uh, regardless, you're going to have to do some greasing and checking to make sure you, your mechanical linkages and all are uh, functioning properly. Um, and usually most maintenance procedures will be, you know, every one, two, maybe three years on a spring charge type device. Uh, whereas with the AMVAC, we say at least inspect it every five years. Um, and, and that also applies to our RMAG outdoor product line, which utilizes the same type of magnetic actuation technology. Um, this is very simple for training because on the actuator for the AMVAC, you do not adjust it, you don't grease it, you don't tune it. You, you, there's nothing that you're supposed to do to this within the life of the breaker. It is, it is designed and built to, to last the entire life. Um, and then, We'll get into, in just a moment, the embedded diagnostics that come internal with the AMVAC breaker. Um, and the reliability, of course, is that we've only seen a 0.08% failure, but that's not on the actuator itself. It's been on the control electronics. Uh, the actuator, I myself personally have never seen one fail uh, yet. And, and I've seen these actuators go up to 30,000 operations um, in, in some instances. Uh, so. The, the current draw for this actuation type is actually in relatively low, and I'll talk about that why in just a few moments. So here's just the side, wave, side cutout view of the AMVAC, which uh, similar to the one we saw previously with the spring charge breaker, except in the fact that 
you have this uh, actuator here, which is just has a single uh, moving part in the actuator, and then you have the main shaft, and then the rest of the components in the pole. So, you, so all in all, on an AMBAC circuit breaker, you have approximately only eight moving parts uh, compared to, say, any type of spring charge breaker, which is going to be three times that amount of moving components. Um, and that, that low or low amount of moving components gives you the low no maintenance, um, and which is a high reliability. It's also a high safety factor because less time the maintenance personnel have to go around and, and check on the breakers and see what's going on. Uh, the safer things are, and also we'll we'll talk about you do get a long term cost savings with that. Um, now we talked about the uh, voltages uh, or excuse me. Uh, low amount of current used for the breaker, uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about capacitors, which are your stored energy. Uh, capacitors act kind of like your charging spring and uh, your standard spring charge breaker. Um, and then you have what's called the ED2 control board, um, and we have two control boards. One's a low voltage board and one's a high voltage board, um, being that that voltage is the input control voltage, which provides the charging power and operational power um, for the breaker, um, even though I can, you can see here where it says high voltage board operates from 77 up to 280 volts AC or DC, that high voltage board uh, will actually charge at, with only 40 volts going into it. It just takes a longer period of time. We quote the range uh, that it takes for it to charge the standard seven seconds that it's supposed to. So if I had 40 volts going into a high voltage board, it might take me, you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds uh, to charge rather than the standard seven seconds. The input voltage range, you now these, the input voltages are the voltages that are used to do your close and open operations. And, and I'll talk about your inputs in just a moment. Um, there is a low power setting on this board. So the standard current or uh, wattage is 100 watts. Um, at seven seconds, and then it drops down to 10 watts for the remainder to, to do its internal diagnostics and everything. But that 100 watts can be reduced down to 33 watts with a low power setting. Um, this is only if you really wanted to do a remote station that was running off of batteries the majority of the time, and you wanted to try to extend the life of those batteries in that location. Um, normally, this would only be seen uh, in areas of like uh, mountainous regions that are very inaccessible. Um, and also utilized sometimes on our outdoor RMAG product, which could be seen in some remote stations. Um, also, the board has output contacts for ready status, so it does a lot of internal checks and stuff and, and checks the uh, voltage and charge on the capacitors and tells you if it's ready or not ready, and I'll talk a little more about that in just a moment. Now, the, the built-in trip and closed coil features. Now, you, you have you actually have the open and closing coil of the actuator, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about the design of that. Uh, but the control board will do uh, coil monitoring by sending a 1K hertz signal to the open coil and, the one, and then to the closed coil and testing the impedance of these coils. So it's, it's actually a true coil monitoring type circuit, whereas with a spring charge breaker, you're, you're only testing the uh, continuity of the coil in, in the older breakers, and of course, um, that's how with the smart coil we also have true coil mon uh, true coil monitoring because we have the electronics that goes in and tests the impedance of the actual coil itself, um, and to extend the life of the breaker and make sure that those coils never have any issue in the ampac, we pulse those coils only for like 45 milliseconds with enough energy to provide the uh, opening or closing operation. Um, also, additionally, we have an auxiliary or protection trip uh, feature on the control board. A lot of people will request that, you know, you have two independent uh, opening coils in, in a circuit. Well, even though we use one electronic board, there are actually two independent circuits on that board. Uh, one being the primary circuit, which utilizes the processor and onboard electronics to do all the internal checks, uh, but there is also a safe open feature which bypasses all the other onboard electronics, will dump all the energy out of capacitors into the open coil 
and force the breaker to do an open should an error ever occur. Um, and then you have your control status indications and outputs. As I said, we have that the output contact, but there's also a ready out, uh, ready light, which is on the front of the breaker, just above the open and close push buttons. And then in a moment, we'll talk about the additional features of this circuit breaker. So here you go is the uh, side view of the magnetic actuation. Um, you have your your closing and opening coil, your permanent magnets, the operation counter, and your movable armature. I'm going to go ahead and, and start moving ahead a little faster. It seems like I'm taking quite a bit of time. Um, so here we are as an exploded view of that same actuator. The movable armature is the only moving part of this actuator. Now here uh, is the magnetic flux density of that actuator at rest. You'll see that the permanent magnets have a large amount of magnetic flux holding that breaker in uh, its position forever until we perform an operation. And so when we go to close the breaker, we energize the closed coil on the bottom. And this closed coil gives us a higher density of magnetic flux on the bottom, which then pulls that armature downward to close the breaker. Once that armature moves and has come to rest at the bottom, you can see that there's a high area of magnetic flux between the, the closed coil, which is still energized at the instant that it has fully closed. And then after that fully closed has occurred, the coil de-energizes and the breaker is at rest again. This picture is the inverse of the first, so it operates exactly in the same manner for an opening operation, and the breaker will stay in whatever open or closed position it is forever until one of the coils is actuated. Magnetic, uh, excuse me, magnets. We use a rare earth magnets, which uh, of course will lose no density. 1% <laughs> over 100 years, I think they'll outlive me. Um, capacitors for uh, your life rear breaker, the the operating capacitors do, their life can be projected according to the temperature range that the breaker is at. Of course, the AMVAC is, is more suited for indoor applications, but we do see some outdoor applications occurring. Additional features, um, wrong position auto trip feature, a breaker is sent to close. If it doesn't see it cl fully closed within 95 milliseconds, it'll open that mechanism just to ensure that uh, you don't have any arcing or anything going between the uh, contacts. You also have a what's called a temperature shutdown feature. It doesn't shut down the breaker per se. What it does is it decreases the voltage that is on the capacitors uh, linearly as temperature increases, and this prevents the capacitors from bulging, um, especially particularly in hot environments. Uh, the EV2 board also has silicon conform coating, which helps protect it from vibration and shock. Uh, these breakers have been tested for uh, seismic conditions in our switch gear. And then we have the inputs um, on the filter card. The filter card has uh, additional filters depending upon the application. We can cut little jumpers that can increase the input voltage. Um, as I stated earlier, the inputs uh, can operate from like 20 volts all the way up to like 260 volts. And in some cases, people uh, will only want it to be from 70 volts on up. So you could cut one of these jumpers and raise that input threshold voltage, especially if you have a system that uh, has a lot of injected noise into the control lines. Um, then there's user, user settable options. You have the under voltage uh, energy failure auto trip. So you can set this so that if your breaker for some reason or control voltage or whatever it may be, causes the breaker to start to lose uh, energy on the capacitors um, before it loses just enough energy to do an open, it will cause the breaker to open when it's set on. Of course, standard under voltage trip options, just like you would on a spring charge type breaker. Um, and then the charging I had mentioned before, which is at 100 watts um, for seven seconds, and that's when the breaker is fully charged and ready, and then it drops down to 10 watts after that to main change the charge and perform its internal self-diagnostics, uh, such as the coil monitoring, the temperature monitoring, the voltage monitoring, the capacitors, and it also has an onboard watchdog timer in case there was to be a failure with the CPU. 
Um, we talk about the benefits of this type of actuation. These numbers here are just uh, for reference, uh, and you could always, you know, someone could always go in and put in how much their actual cost is and, and estimate how much money having a magnetic actuator breaker would save you versus having a spring charge breaker would save you in terms of service uh, over the years. And just to touch base on, you know, the types of uh, configurations that the breakers do come in, uh, medium voltage breakers, we have a standard draw out, which is for your standard medium voltage switch gear or uh, L-frame constructions that we give to OEMs. Um, and you can see here on the right, this is an actual breaker cell with a draw configured breaker in its cell. Um, the draw configuration can then have added roll on wheels, um, which some people do utilize in certain applications, which it makes it easier to insert, insert the breaker in and out of the switch gear. Or on some skid mounted type uh, installations, you'll, uh, OEMs will utilize a uh, fixed mount breaker configuration. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and move on over to the DS1 capacitive switch device. I, I have just touched on some main concepts of the medium voltage circuit breakers. Uh, there are a lot more details that you can talk about in terms of capacitive switching and, and applications of whatnot of the circuit breakers. Um, but it looks like I've already run out of time. For those of you who would like to remain, I will go over the DS1 diode based transient free capacitor switch. Um, and this device is not a circuit breaker, but it is specifically applied for capacitive switching in terms of those TRVs that uh, you know I had uh, talked about that are created by switching utilizing a vacuum interrupter on a circuit breaker. So as I had stated previously, a capacitive switch rating on a medium voltage circuit breaker is kind of a secondary rating. You know, the primary rating is its ability to break open a large fault. So with the DS1, we'll go over some of the, quickly as soon as we can, uh, what is the application of the DS1? Well, in today's market, you know, we see the need for using capacitor banks to uh, help with reactive power in power systems. Um, and switching in and out of those capacitor banks can cause, um, excuse me, for power factor correction, but switching in and out of those capacitor banks can cause TRVs into your network system. So as you switch and say you're using a uh, vacuum circuit breaker, this effect can have a uh, negative impact on, on your capacitor bank and on your uh, inductors in the system over time and reduce the life of your system. Capacitive load switching, now this was uh, brought forward just as we saw previously, the capacitive switch standards on a circuit breaker where you have these probabilities of restrikes um, and you have no method of really predicting when you will have a restrike or pre-strike. And this causes system instabilities and which can cause to uh, lead to a voltage escalation and which can cause a blackout due to the failure of the component. So this pre-strike happens during the capacitors, capacitor switching in, and the restrikes happen when you're switching the capacitors out. Now, to minimize that, uh, to, to increase your reliability of your system, you have to minimize this risk. Uh, you have to minimize the disturbances caused by it, and you know that would help minimize your maintenance, minimize you know your predicted out your <laughs> minimize your unpredicted outages, excuse me, and increase your efficiency of your power factor um, when you're utilizing your cap banks. And all if you're able to accomplish this, all in all, then you minimize uh, your cost in the long term. So most today's technologies, if you're using uh, capacitive, or excuse me, circuit breakers to do capacitive switching. You're going to have to be adding in surge arresters and interrupt reactors to your system to mitigate these effects. Um, these, these devices can take up space and have uh, heat dissipations associated with them. So using the DS1, which is a new concept, we use synchronized switching coupled with solid state technology. 
and this provides us with a device that has uh, no restrikes whatsoever. And I kind of put here a C infinity, which is not a rating. Uh, it's just uh, some some possibility I would I would recommend <laughs> in a sense. But uh, it, it's a device that's new to the market, so there really is presently no standard that can apply to its ability. So we would have to label it a C2 device. Um, this device is we presently have it rated for both IEC and ANSI market. Um, the ANSI market being at the 15 kV level, uh, the IEC market's the 17 and a half kV levels, uh, the 600 and 630 amps, uh, with a mechanical life of 50,000 operations, an electrical life of uh, 10,000 uh, full capacitive current switching. Now, as I stated before, this is a switching device. It is not a breaker. So you see it has this short time of scan current. Um, so this device would need to have some sort of protection, whether it be a circuit breaker or fuses in series with it to protect it. It is not there to break a fault in any way. Um, this device was actually developed for a particular customer. Uh, they came to us and said, we have an issue, can you provide a solution? Um, so we developed it and through uh, several years of uh, trial and error and design. Um, we've come up with the final solution that, that I'm presenting here. And I'm going to try to get through this a little quicker than normal uh, due to the time constraints. But uh, all this uh, information will be available online um, through ADD.com. You can look up the DS1 capacitor switch technology. Um, there's a good video and um, everything that you see here today. Um, so what we have here in this next slide is you can see the these are the actual graphs that were taken of the at the installation prior to application of the DS1 and during the capacitor switches that they had specific design capacitor switches for that application the the customer was still seeing these adverse transients onto their system. These adverse transients over time caused failures of components and then led to a major outage uh, to their end users. Um, and here is just an overview of the pilot installation. So it gives you a basic rundown on if you're familiar with capacitor banks, this will look very familiar. But like I said, I'm going to try to get through some of this information uh, relatively quickly and just hit on the main points now. Um, so here it is in, in service, the uh, DS1. Uh, up top, you see the graphs of your bus of voltage being monitored, and you have your passive voltage and your faster current. So as you're closing in your, your device, you have no inrush from your currents because the DS1, what it does is it precisely closes on current zero. So with the three phases, to do that, you would close in one phase, and then the other two phases go 180 degrees out, and then you close in the other two phases together, and that can be seen here in the graphs. Uh, also goes for the opening of the device, uh, where one phase will open, and then the other two phases will start to go 180 degrees out, and then the two phases will open together simultaneously. This gives us no over voltages, uh, sorry, <laughs> into the, the system. <clears throat> and this is provided due to a movable contact and a diode stack, as, as previously mentioned. And utilizing a semiconductor stack of diodes, dry air, we have the DS1 pole. And during the switching operation, you'll notice here there's actually two switches in the circuit. So what happens is the main shaft here is operated by the mechanism at a precise time and then it closes in and allows current to flow through the diode stack um, and this is done at the, the first positive wave of the voltage so the signal is sent to the device the device is monitoring the voltage on the main bus when when the voltage hits current zero it then closes in to the diodes and you'll see here that this this first positive wave is slightly lopsided, that's because the diodes don't start to conduct until the voltage reaches a certain point. And then as the diodes conduct the first positive swing of the wave, the 
the main rod shaft pushes up connecting to the second contact and then closing in at the next current zero bypassing the diode. And then you have the full closed condition, which then is pretty much similar to having just a piece, piece of straight puff bar applied to your, your connection points. And, and there's no adverse effects to your system. So then once you go to open the device, you send a signal to open. It then sees that the current wave is starting to come back up to positive again, in which case it then opens up here to allow the current path to flow through the diode. The diode conducts the last half cycle wave, and then, then the uh, rod moves back down, opening up the main circuit, and then current and voltage have completely ceased. The architecture of the DS1 utilizes a voltage sensor, three independent poles, which, which are controlled via rotary encoded motors, uh, an ACU system with uh, capacitors for energy storage. Um, the PC is not part of the device. The, the ACU is the main heart of the device. The device can be used independently. It does not require a PC. In any ways, that's just for servicing. So if we wanted to come in, and look at the uh, waveforms and, and uh, the motion waveforms of the device. The device actually monitors its motion uh, through every opening and closing. It monitors the torque and monitors the winding of the, the uh, motors and the air pressure internal to the DS1 itself. Um, the DS1 has onboard diagnostic features. These diagnostic features will do a micro movement every 24 hours. And this, what this does is it, it tests the whole linkage for whether it has the proper torque. So if that torque is too high or too low, it'd be too high if say something's binding or jamming or too low if something's become disconnected or whatever. And we'll signal that out through one of the output contacts to say that there is an issue. Um, also it has onboard watchdog timer, similar to uh, the AMBAC circuit breaker. Also, <laughs> during the full motion of the, the device, it monitors the torque to also ensure that uh, there's no other issues arising. If, if it sees that the torque is starting to come out of specs, specs it actually has a output contact that'll say that service is, will be required, um, but, it, but it will still mean that the device is still functional. It's just that it's predicting it's gonna need some kind of service in the future. The brushless servo motors of the, of the device, like I said, uh, one phase will have to do an operation and then the other two phases go 180 degrees out. And this is accomplished by using three independent brushless servo motors, which have a high resolution. Um, both motor or all motors, excuse me, have dual encoders. Um, so if there was a failure of one encoder, there's still a backup encoder. And if that was to occur, that would then give you a, a signal going out saying that maintenance is required in which time the service personnel could come in and test the device and, and find out what is failing, which motor uh, in the future, and have a replacement done in a timely manner without affecting your system in any way, shape, or form, because the device will still be operational. Um, we'll talk about the capacitors. Similar to the AMVAC, we have the capacitors and say two levels of power because the capacitor is, is a primary storage unit, but you still have uh, your main control supply coming in that is used during actual, uh, your actuation operations. Um, then you have an air pressure sensor. Um, the, the internals of the pole is just dry air pressure. It's not a vacuum, it's not FS6. And, and this pressure is just slightly, uh, uh, well, it's 4.7 bar. Um, so it measures the, that pressure to make sure that your dry air hasn't leaked out, but even if it does start to leak out, it gives you a warning saying that it's starting to experience a leak. You can still do an operation during this time period, um, but it's not until it reaches a low where then the device will say air pressure is too low that it won't operate. So you have a pre-warning before this will occur. You have your communications, which are then provided through uh, dry output contacts. Uh, similarly, with your inputs, 
They're very similar to what you see on the AMVAC device where you have a wide voltage range. Um, in this case, it's 24 from 220 volts. Uh, same with the uh, power supply. You, you have the high voltage input of this, which is 110 to 240. So just to recap a little bit, uh, you know, transient free, no restrikes or pre strikes so you don't have to worry about any contact wear. You have your integrated control unit, which controls all your synchronization, actualization, your diagnostics. Um, this also provides uh, built-in uh, interlocks and tells you about, you know, when your maintenance will occur. So for maintenance personnel, really, they're just going to do a visual inspection. The benefits of this device are the sizing, uh, space savings that it, it will give you because you're eliminating your inrush reactors in, in most cases because the device is closing in at a current zero. So you have zero inrush from your tap banks during the switching on phase. Um, so this gives you the added benefit, as we had talked about before, of uh, your reliability and peace of mind and keeping your system overall health for the future and done with your efficiency and performance. Uh, this will help also uh, your end users. Um, now, as I stated, uh, I think I'm gonna try to move along here a little faster. So I've got a, one too many slides. Uh, this is just a primary example where an installation was reviewed, uh, a customer example where the DS1 was applied and the capacitors were eliminated in the cap banks and the overall size of the, the reactors outside of the cap banks were then able to be reduced um, in the system. So this downsizing, you know, saves space, saves money. And then we have uh, just some calculations that show the difference from going from a DS1 and a vacuum circuit breaker into a system, your overall cost savings isn't just with your footprint um, and your circuit design, but you know also the overall power losses over the years. So in this instance, a uh, little where we had calculated a long-term savings over 30 years, um, we've seen almost up to a million dollars just in things such as maintenance, uh, footprint, and power losses being cut from the overall uh, cost of operations. Um, then get into a technology comparison. There are uh, similar technologies on the market for capacitive switching. Um, and we'll just review this really quick of a simple single line model of a 6.9 kV system with two M-bar cap banks in a back-to-back -back scenario. And we'll go over from having no damping to uh, synchronized vacuum pre-insertion resistors, and then the DS1 switch. So with no dampening, you can see that during switching uh, of a standard breaker, you're gonna have a large amount of transients which will be introduced into your system. Once you go into and add in uh, inductance, your series inductance, and this avoids your third and fifth harmonics, you start to see a little, you start to see more reduction onto those transients, but they're still there. It's still caused by the circuit breaker. Um, then the next technology would be a pre insertion resistor, uh, where you would have a resistor across the breaker. So you would have to then use two breakers uh, in, in a system with this resistor. So you're, you're increasing your overall footprint size and your cost associated with this system design, um, but yet you still have, haven't eliminated your transients into the system. Um, then you have synchronized vacuum. Uh, synchronized vacuum uh, isn't precise because you know all on a vacuum breaker, all three phases open and close uh, simultaneously, uh, whereas with the DS1, each phase is operating independently. Then we have the synchronized diode closing with uh, natural energization, excuse me, the diode switch itself. Um, so from energization, you'll see that uh, we, we've eliminated the inrushes of uh, switching on the voltage side for the, with utilizing the DS1 technology. So just to recap the uh, transients that we 
we reviewed in a rather uh, quick manner. Sorry about that, but uh, time is running out, or actually has run out quite well. Um, so this documentation, of course, like I stated, is all online, and you can download it at abb.com. Um, one other technology which isn't in, in that comparison was a thyristor. A thyristor really is just like a uh, similar to the DS1, except it's not mechanical. It's it's uh, like a transistor uh, type device. Uh, it has high power losses, it's oil cool. Um, anything that utilizes oil for cooling, that oil has to be tested and it can leak and then you have uh, specific disposal requirements. Um, this, this also can lead to, you know, you, you've got to have uh, your cooling of the overall uh, in, excuse me, facility due to this. Also, uh, limited operations, and you know you can't stay closed in for an extended period of time. The DS1 is unlimited in its operations. Uh, the diode stack only conducts for a very short period of time and has uh, almost zero heat dissipation. Uh, and once the device is closed, it's basically, like I said before, just like a straight piece of bus bar, so um, it can stay closed in uh, forever uh, in particular cases. So I'd like to thank everybody today for their time. It seems I've gone well over uh, the hour allotted, but uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me at uh, abb.com. Uh, this is my contact information. Thank you all for attending.